Note 1, 4th of January. My name is irrelevant, and I am alone. Since the fall, everything has become irrelevant. I often wonder if this opinion is a realization brought about by the fall, making it true even before, or perhaps the irrelevance is a result of the fall, but the matter itself is as irrelevant as my name. Another more relevant matter is that of the cause of the fall. Unfortunately, I cannot help you there. All that I know is that it was not sudden. Society collapsed like an aging mind, losing its progress slowly without being cognizant of the decline. There was no single event that I can trace. It was not violent or chaotic. There was no dramatic scuffle. No, we fell gradually and painlessly as structure simply melted away. So I cannot give you an accurate macro story. There is only the micro, this micro perspective. I do not have a legitimate reason to write of this perspective, of course, and it seems particularly unlikely, given our current, let us say, dilapidated climate, that anyone will even discover this mental spillage, much less read and find value in it. Regardless, I will write of my perspective all the same. I will write of a great many things. In fact, I will write countless notes until that long-awaited day of my release from reality, because legitimate reasons are for those who have attempted to grasp some sort of structure. The structures are gone. It's all gone. And all that is left is an empty world for me to wander aimlessly, with all the pomp of a king, as if my continued existence were anything but the result of a biologically programmed will to survive, and a cowardice to stifle nature's plans. Certainly, I would prefer to be dead. And I imagine this depresses you. You should not worry, though, because this is not the sort of suicidal will that is born of an intense sadness. Rather, this is the desire for death born of a hollow life. The end, at this point, seems like an unfinished work on an already pointless existence. Thus, you should not worry as if I'm in pain or as if I'm some wounded animal that should be snuffed out to stop the suffering. There is no suffering. There is nothing. I am no longer anything, and thus I am useless. Useless things should be tossed aside like garbage to be incinerated. Beyond this, the worry would be unwarranted on another level. I suspect that, if you find these, I will have died well before. I should note that I am fully aware of the other survivors, reader. There are a few in this complex, although I really do despise that term. Among the present humanity, I am one of the last who is old enough to remember the fall, and I know that it was far less dramatic than our stories typically tell or told. To call us survivors is to imply that the fall was something difficult to survive. There are not nearly as many of us around, certainly, but that is because we stopped breeding and spread out, not because we died. The fall brought stagnation more than death, and stagnation brings a different kind of decay. It brings a slow decay. Like me, our world became useless, and the natural process of crumbling took over. So, at last, a single question remains. That is, should you read this at all? At this point, it should be obvious that I cannot give you any reason to do so. You are one of two types of people. The first type, the type that is far more common, is someone who has only ever known the fallen world. The second type, one that you probably are not, is someone who has lived just long enough to recursively recognize the decline. To the first type, these notes will be extremely depressing. To the second, these notes will present nothing that has not already been seen or felt. There is no third type of person who could find this useful. They're all gone. My name is Irrelevant. I am alone. Note number two, 6th of January. It occurred to me that these notes will likely be found in my home, meaning a description of the place is unwarranted. Therefore, rather than give you an image of what is undoubtedly the least tasteful residence in existence, I would like for you to think of this particular note as a series of directions. Only follow these directions if you are so inclined, to discover my material life like a detective searching for clues leading to a murder. Murder, incidentally, 
was what those of us before the fall called the intentional killing of another human being. We had structures in place to, to discourage and prevent that sort of thing, never really changing the fact that people wanted to do so all the same. Anyway, you should start by examining my desk. There you will see my typewriter and my papers. The unused papers are sealed away in the drawers on the right side, so as to prevent decay. The spare ink is similarly protected. You may find use for those now that I am no longer requiring them, and I do hope that you will keep the typewriter somewhat intact. I realize that it has potential as a wellspring of scrap, but I have a deep fondness for it as a machinery. It has its use, and it carries it out semi-flawlessly, without question or complaint. I admire that about the machines of old. Oh, that reminds me. I should also mention my pens. If you check the third drawer from the top on the left side of the desk, you will see a collection of unused mechanical pens designed for writing by hand, similar to the chalk or pencils you are probably familiar with. The pens have a store of ink inside of them, much like the typewriter, so they are somewhat limited. Do take care of this equipment. I am aware that writing as an endeavor is not something humans seem to have kept from our pre-fallen state, but it is extremely important that someone continues to write who is more capable than myself. With these tools, I am just as useless as before. But someone with more content can produce something of worth. Wait, is that someone with more content or someone with more content? I'm not actually sure. Moving along, on the opposite side of the room there is a brick wall with wooden boards sitting at the base. If you would like to use this room as a residence, I am now obviously not in a position to decline, not that I would have been had I still been alive. Indeed, if you do take this room, the brick wall you see there will become extremely important to you. If you examine it closely, you will see that some of the bricks, the ones at eye level, are loose. The windows are boarded for the obvious reasons, but these loose bricks provide a quick way to observe the exterior world. Avoiding surprises is always a useful key to avoiding release from existence. It's best to keep watch of your own prison, I find. Of course, if you are caught by surprise, there are various clubs and spears under the mattress near the kerosene lamp. <laughs> but who am I fooling? I'm sure you have a better collection of weaponry. Finally, you should be aware of my storeroom. There is a floor panel in the middle of this upper room that acts as a door to a basement. There you will find a great wealth of canned food. Most of it may have spoiled by now, but some of these simpler materials should be edible, or at least marketable. Along with the cans, there are several can openers hanging on the wall besides the stairs. These irreplaceable and curiously simple tools seem to be the most valuable assets in our world. Also, and this final instruction is incredibly important, do not introduce heat into this basement. It has considerable airflow from the outside because of its barred, but open, windows on two orthogonal walls, so it is always quite cold. Food does not spoil if it is refrigerated, which is an old way of saying chilled. We had large machines that did this for us, some of which you may have been littering, uh, you may have seen littering the old residential areas, but we have to resort to other means of achieving this effect now. Once the season's turn and summer approaches, you will need to scavenge for more canned resources. This is the most dangerous time of the year. While I'm sure you are capable enough, you should be aware that the heat of the sun will prevent the refrigeration effect that I previously mentioned, spoiling your new store of material. Do your best to find more and eat only what will spoil quickly, so that you can save the canned material for the winter. I'm not sure of the route you took to get into this complex but the only entrance I'm aware of is the single door on the south side. The main double doors should be completely blocked off from the interior. I made sure of that. The single door is easily accessible, but it is also easy to defend. I recommend some sort of blocking system that you can move to and from the door on the inside, though traps may be more suitable for you. Personally, I could never stomach the thought. It was not due to a sensory or even emotional inability, mind you as I have seen enough to be fairly immune to the disgusting nature of the death process. Rather, I can never justify taking a life, or even maiming one, to protect one that is undeniably lesser. Oh, 
and while considering the topic of protection, I will say that you should avoid other scavengers over the course of the summer, even while you're outside of this complex. I can't really make the case that they're terribly malicious, but people have a way of abandoning decency when their quest for prolonged life is jeopardized. That is to say, canned food is obviously sparse, and they will fight you for it, just as they'd fight you for my abode. I only bring this up because, in the old times, we all expected the world to turn into a dangerous place after any sort of fall. I guess we adopted the idea, so as to justify structure. In truth, the world did not become more dangerous. Rather, it became quiet. Sleeping on its deathbed, humanity clings to life for no other reason than instinct, all the while deserving nothing but a swift end. Ah, but what am I saying? You know this. Again, you're here. You're fit. You conquer the obstacle of your own mortality to arrive at mortality's playground, and I would suggest you feel pride if the whole ordeal wasn't so manifestly pointless. On that note, I do not know why I'm even bothering to help you. I think that I already like you because you managed to find my residence. I suppose that demonstrates at least a modicum of talent. I have none of that, at least none that would matter in this world. So I appreciate it in you, reader. For all I know, well, I don't know anything, do I? I'm dead. I should say, for all I would have known, you could be a terrible person. You could be one of those who have sacrificed decency and empathy at the altar of pragmatism, as if your actions are excusable because of your fear of death. Still, you would possess talent, all the same. Interestingly, people of the sort existed well before the fall. That is, vile people. I often get the sense that you and the others view the pre-fallen world as a sort of mystical place of happiness and good. Nonsense. People were just as terrible. The fall acted as a great unveiling force for the observation of these people. The only difference between this world and the old one is that we now experience considerably less comfort. Comfort, it seems, acts as mud in otherwise clear water. It became difficult to see just how terrible humanity was through the various social cues and structures we adopted, tricking ourselves into believing that we were evolved. I don't feel proud of it. I don't feel proud that I saw what people were through, through what they pretended to be, even before the fall. I was a misanthropist. Wait, that's, is that how you pronounce it? Misanthrop? I don't remember how to pronounce it. Anyway, can you blame me? If you think I'm wrong, then you're an idiot. If you think I'm pointlessly negative, then you were asking me to lie. Dishonesty is by far the most offensive crime, and to lie to myself is worse than to lie to anyone else, because I spend more time with myself than others, making, this pro making the prospect even more dangerous. If I were to lie about what people are in order to make myself happy, all I would accomplish would be making myself one of them. I would make myself a rat by ignoring the pack. To be fair, it could simply be social idiocy, the idea has been presented to me by essentially everyone I have ever known, though the number of said individuals is frightfully, or perhaps luckily, minuscule. The phrase, sad freak, has been uttered several times. However, outside perspectives tend to be the most accurate by nature of being inherently macro. I would love to believe that there is some missing piece within the complex of social life, effectively justifying behavior, behavior that would otherwise be obviously abhorrent, but there is not. But there is not, it seems. People are more than apparently terrible. And they manage to ignore that through social fluff because they're selfish. I am selfish. I'm incredibly selfish. My selfish nature is manifested in that I hide away from normal people out of my disgust for them. Honesty has this effect. The others have a selfish nature that is exhibited in their continued and pointless attempts to manipulate one another for some fleeting gain. You, for instance, are probably one of the worst just by nature of being here now. What debauchery do you enjoy, I wonder? How often do you manage to convince yourself that trying to maintain the good is not realistic? Ask yourself, if you refuse to commit to morality or anything, for that matter, because you are afraid, are you afraid to ask, are you afraid to risk your happiness, a pathetic concept, indeed, at the hands of good? Yes, you are afraid. I know you are, because you're here in my room. 
Perhaps you are afraid to the point of having convinced yourself that there is no morality. There is just you. Selfish people are only self-absorbed because they're afraid, and selfish people are not good people. So please, do call me a freak. Curse my name under your breath as you read my words. Say it. Say, curse you, irrelevant. I cannot stop you. And why would I? The only difference between you and I is that I am honest. And honestly, we're all cowards. But, of course, it is here that I should apologize, though I do not fully understand why. It is obvious that I am a negative soul, and it is obvious that most people are blissfully stupid to the point of being what I venom venomously describe as optimistic. So I imagine my barrage of weaponized reality is devastating. No, not devastating. Pity. That's what you feel, isn't it? <laughs> you absolute dullard. I take back my apology. Of course that's what you feel. Because you only ever feel. You're like the rest of the poor buffoons who feel before they think. And thus you make your thoughts irrelevant like me. You're not even internalizing the actual implications of my negativity, are you? With each passing remark of this, of the absolute ridiculousness of reality, you wonder what wound I hold that makes me twisted. With each jab at your preposterous notions of self-worth, you imagine me experiencing some trauma that ruined my psyche forever. Be it the death of a loved one, molestation, torture, abuse, or perhaps the fall itself, you wonder what happened to me. Well, let us remove the fog. The reason I am negative is because I am now totally moronic. Yes, that's all. I am just barely intelligent enough to see the vanity of every last piece of this universe. Are you now shifting your thoughts? Are you now supposing that I am simply insane, thus moving from pity to disgust? I have heard the ceaseless echoes of your popular psychology, reader, and they do not move me. Your repeated assertions of a broken mind that you claim are born of your own intuitions are wholly weightless, and your ironically patronizing desire to comfort me in this realization simply shows your complete neglect for critical thought. You feel what you want to feel, and think as a result. Idiocy. For as long as I am alive, I will think before I feel. My thoughts lead me to the conclusions that there is nothing but void, and I will feel accordingly. The final assumption of my character is on the horizon. Soon you will imagine me to be enjoying my negativity. From pity to disgust to hatred, you'll arrive at a place where I am like the others who wallow in their own pathetic nature. As if perceived sadness is a style of clothing that I can don to foster some notion of uniqueness. If I were like them, I would value myself as an individual. To do so would be to ignore sense. You are wrong, but you are wrong for a different reason than you might suspect. It is not that the inverse of your assumption is true. That is to say, I am not deeply depressed or saddened by the vanity of everything. Consider what I told you before. This is not the sort of morbid sense that is born of sadness. No. I am morbid because I recognize the hollow nature of life. You cannot escape the fact that I am not a wounded animal to be pitied. I am not so insane as to be wrong, and I am certainly not masturbatory in my recognition of pointlessness. These buffers of assumption you place between your world and mine are as pathetic as your pursuit of happiness. So please, spare me your bloated assumptions of emotional damage and engage my assertions with some semblance of reason. At least make the attempt to discuss with me on my own terms. That is, intelligent terms. Not that I am uniquely gifted with intellect. On the contrary, I believe I am somewhat dense. I believe I am somewhat dense relative to most minds. You, on the other hand, refuse to use your intelligence. And I have no patience for that. So I suggest you stop reading this now if you are so inclined to continue analyzing my psychology with all the ability and intuition of an ape simply to create obstacles between the truth of what I am saying and your concept of reality. I am not unique. I am not especially intelligent. I am by no means attractive. And I am certainly not interesting. However, I am right. Therefore, the better methodology is that of conflict. Rather than enduring your condescending attempts at psychoanalysis, I invite you to converse with me. Engage in argumentation as if we were playing chess. Sit down where I sat before, at this desk, and do battle with my ideas. 
put aside your archetypical pondering. Ar arch no, not archetypical. Archetypal. Yes, archetypal pondering. For just long enough to see my pieces on the board and react to them using the rules of the game. After all, such an engagement is a statement of respect. I've shown my respect for you, reader. I want to argue with you. And I would not if I did not believe that you are capable of reciprocating. Add meaning to this drivel by understanding it. Admittedly, I do presume to be right, meaning I assume that you are wrong, as I know you disagree with me. I know you have a far less negative view of the world, but I respect your intelligence all the same. Even the smartest minds can hold the stupidest ideas simply because they refuse to try. Note number three, 9th of January. I forgot to mention something in my last note. I forgot to tell you about my most prized possession. Indeed, this single object is more important than the whole of my life. It is essentially sacred, although it is not religious or even spiritually oriented. This book, this tome, if you will, is your key to the vasts of humanity. Above my desk, just below the wooden trim that remains on the ceiling, you will see a hole covered by some stretched leather from an old glove. If you remove this covering, you will see a small hollow. In this hollow is the greatest treasure you will ever find in all of your scavenging. Bound in cloth and elastic string for preservation, my dictionary with an attached encyclopedia sits in the dark, waiting for you to discover it. This single book allows you to understand my rambling. More importantly, it is a window into the old world. By nature of not knowing the old world, you are relatively ignorant. You should not worry, and I should hope that you are not so easily offended, as ignorance is not something that anyone can truly fault, at least not legitimately. To some extent, you cannot legitimately fault anyone for stupidity either. Intelligence can certainly be trained, so there is at least marginal room for fault. But the true culprit, the true culprit of our intellectual downfall is a lack of creativity. In my experience, creativity is nothing but a willingness to use one's intelligence to understand the connected nature of data. Understanding itself is a creation, and this dictionary provides you with a wellspring of data. You actually have a psychological advantage over the people of old, because data is sparser than it was before. You have a drive to collect it. Before, we had structures built to feed us data, regardless of whether or not we wanted it or found it useful. Oh. On that note, I should say that not all of the data in this dictionary will be useful to you. Do not attempt to memorize all of the words in our language, as that would be ridiculous and chiefly a waste of time. Rather, think of this new wellspring as a companion. I have other books from the time from the times of old scattered throughout this room, and your new guide will help you navigate their secrets. Search for th uh, search them for clues like you search my residence. Scavenge them for knowledge, like you scavenge for food. If you do not trust in their worth, allow me to use my life as an example. Factual data, especially if anecdotal, has a way of leading people to truth without taking them through the muddy waters of personal bias and comfort. Yet it somehow remains authentic by nature of it being personal all the same. Any anyway, when I was young, very young, I was expected to learn about the world. It was similar to how uh, to how young people are expected to learn of survival now. However, in the comfort of the old world, survival was pushed aside to make way for broader and more important topics, such as the history of humanity, her thought and her struggles. From this data, we could learn a great many things about life and how to proceed, and there were many ways of acquiring this material. One method was that of schooling. The assumption was that there are people who are more capable than others when it comes to passing knowledge onto children. We call these people teachers or professors. They were held on high as the achievement of thought. They were regarded as the paragon of all learning and the final bastion of reason in society. Unfortunately, this structure was complete nonsense. We neglected a core principle of learning to make way for our pride and our sense of safety. We forgot that people learn when they're interested. Are you interested in your new companion? Perhaps not yet, but you will be when you are presented with a problem that only your companion can solve. 
Comfort eliminated our problems, so we had to create them artificially. Children tend to be smarter than us by nature of not having had the chance to kill their own creativity. So they quickly saw the ruse for what it was, and interest died. Thus, learning died with it. What we were left with was an extremely inefficient method of communication. That was not interesting in and of itself, and did not involve the presentation of any interesting material. Some of us benefited, though, and some of us simply adopted the structure out of hubris, as if memorization was something to be proud of. The arrogance of these individuals contributed to enormous heaps of information. They sat atop their mound of unused data, thinking they had climbed the highest mountain, when, in reality, all they managed to do was smother their own intelligence. I was lucky in that I was not subjected to this method of communication. At least, I was not immediately subjected to it. My parents were somewhat unique in that they allowed me to learn autonomously. In the old world, we had buildings that existed as storerooms for books. I have my own library behind me on the metal shelves, but it is nothing compared to the sheer scale of these collections. Imagine almost limitless amounts of knowledge and thought contained in a single building. A grander thought I have never conjured. And to think, it's a memory. It's a memory of something that actually existed. What fools we were to ignore its worth. It is gone now, but I experienced it. Do you know how to teach a child to swim? One way is to describe the motion, the motions to the child. You can even describe buoyancy and the basic properties of water. Still... Another method is to simply throw the child into the ocean, expecting the child to either die in the deep or learn through an extremely troubling experience. Neither of these methods are the ideal. What would happen if you gave the child a rowboat? Better yet, give the child a galleon. The child may never learn to swim, admittedly. In fact, the child may never learn to leave the boat at all. But some children will not be able to tame their interest for long. Some children will see the water from the boat, and they will dive in. Luckily, the ocean is vast, and there are many places to explore and find interest in, so the other children would not be far behind. I can still recall the words of my parents as they left me at the library for countless hours. Go and learn, they said. Never was I given a direction. Never was I tested. No, I explored. You might be tempted to think that I was alone, but you would be wrong. I was participating in the full breadth of human experience. I stood beside great men and women as I was given their secrets, their correct and their false information. All of it painted a picture of reality that became more interesting as it unfolded. Like you, I found a great treasure, and I used it where I found interest. The others did not approve of this methodology, I'm afraid. Do you want to know why? It was because they were afraid. They avoided learning for the same reason that we are all evil. We're cowards. In this setting, their greatest fear was of being wrong, so they adopted standard content told in standard ways. Standard things are not interesting things. Everything I learned from reading the various texts of the library was a true discovery. Value was based on my reaction, so what I learned was, of course, sporadic. I learned about astronomy, I dipped into mathematics, marine biology became important to me, and literature of almost all kinds was my love. I learned everything I could about everything that seemed important, because it was in front of me for a limited time, and there were others who learned this way as well. They were few in number, but they existed. I spoke with one such child when I was of a similar age, and we discussed what we had discovered. I could see the same spark of exploration in his eyes that was undoubtedly present in mine. Everything was new. There was no sense of pride in any of it, either. We both learned different things, and when the learning overlapped, it was coincidence that gave way to acquaintance. Where our findings differed, the experience produced sharing. On the other hand, when I talked with the countless hordes of horrid children from the schooling system, Every piece of information was a medal they wore on their chest with a most disgusting sense of achievement. If I shared my findings related to a children's novel, or perhaps an obscure work of fiction, I was met with the same repeated Shakespearean drivel. 
You haven't read Romeo and Juliet? Are you slow or something? I had to read that in the fourth grade, I was told. What I learned was not important because it was not standard. A great portion of thought was completely wiped out because it was not on some test given by some dry and dusty moron with some chalk and a piece of paper that dictates who is and who is not a member of the upper echelon of intellectual success. I don't like the work of Shakespeare. I find it to be void of any interesting content and entirely worthless. But that was simply my interest speaking. If some other child found it to be interesting, I would have been in no position to assert anything objective. What I found interesting was so because I'm part of a diverse pool of humans. Not so with school, it seems. Shakespeare was arbitrarily deemed essential to the knowledge of all life, and to not be interested in Shakespeare's shoddy and absurdly uninteresting drool was to declare oneself an idiot of the highest order. Yes, I, I was a moron because I did not swoon over the poorly constructed plays of some dead wordsmith who was so unable to use his language that he resorted to simply making up his own. At least, that is some form of creativity, I suppose. In truth, the hideous nature of the other children was only in part due to the structure they were subjected to. There were other, f there were other factors, such as their social climate. Rather than placing them in the context of the full age range of humanity, allowing for a maximum experience, parents placed their children on an industrial track only with those of the same year group. The practice is similar to defecating into a paper bag and breathing into it until passing out. We took the undeveloped nature of young humans and amplified it by leaving them alone together creating what is undeniably the most toxic environment in all of human history. At the end of it, we called it childhood. We called it growth. We labeled it normal, and continued as if every human went through a phase of debauchery. Where was my phase of debauchery? Where were my adolescent days? I do not recall experiencing such a reckless and stupid era of my life that I was to grow out of. In reality, the effects of this veritable toxin simply wore off over the course of the few years after this climate was enjoyed. Oh, how normal it was. Yes, the drunkenness, the pure and self-induced idiocy, the sexual behavior that only accomplished an emotional destruction in later years, and the absolute foul smugness of each and every stupid boy and girl that was manufactured into the same moronic scum over and over. Yes, a phase. Yes, normal. Absolutely preposterous. But, my dear reader, you are exempt from this structure. You have escaped it through the timing of your birth. I congratulate you. It is fitting, indeed, that I was unable to avoid its fruits. It is my punishment for being worthless. Ah, but it's all worthless. No matter. You have a companion, and you can use it to understand the universe. You have within your grasp one of the last keys to that which is truly important. You have a key to that which is grand. And you will not defile it with any sort of trained idiocy. Your new companion will help you if you are interested. And, you see, that is just the point. I am not giving you an instruction on what to learn. Rather, I am simply giving you the instruction to learn. Your interest will guide your galleon. And all you must be is willing to sail.